Oh, oh wow. It's nice, intimate. So SoCap went mid-century <laughs> modern this year. It's nice. Uh, I'm actually furniture shopping now. Yes, very nice. These are, the lights are quite bright. Yes. No, I mean, we are in California. <laughs> All right. Hi, everybody. It works. It really works. Okay. Um, so this should be fun, um, despite the fact that I'm moderating it. So Ron, <laughs> pick it up for me. Um, so I'm Mark Newberg. I'm director of impact strategies for Womble Carlisle, which is a law firm. This is 10 years later, how far we've come and where we actually are, or as I subtitled it, uh, Titans of Industry and Me. Uh, so, I, every time we do this, I try and get Dave Chen to laugh out loud, and I already did it. So we're going for over-indexing now. Um, let me do uh, real quick framing, then introductions, and then uh, we're going to do one slightly unusual thing before we get started. But uh, quick framing, this is the 10-year anniversary of SOCAP. Um, a lot has changed, including the amount of technology incorporated into the conference. Um, and impact is different than it was when we started. So the question is, how far have we come? Where are we actually? What do we think about that and what comes next? Um, so by way of introductions, we have Ron Cordes, the co-founder of the Cordes Foundation, Maya Chorningal, um, partner of the RISE Fund, uh, which you may have heard of, Fran Siegel, is executive director of the U.S. Impact Investing Alliance, and Dave Chen is chairman of Equilibrium Capital. Um, so before I ask them questions, I just want to do really quick lightning round, um, two minutes from you. What are the issue areas you hope that we address? And also, am I yelling at you? I can't quite tell. Uh, all right, so issue areas, just raise your hand. I'll call on you. The, not a question, just an issue area, so we can make sure that the conversation we have covers what you're interested in. Anybody? Eric. Okay, thank you, Eric. Do you have a substantive issue area? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, anything you hope that we'll cover? Otherwise, I'll just make up questions on the spot. Yeah. Speak up. Okay, long term capital. Anyone else? Uh, reporting, reporting metrics. All right. Next. Yep. Okay. So that's uh, metrics. Circle that one. Yep. Okay. Invest. Uh, mm -hmm. um, same topic or different topics? Okay. Okay. Maya, you're getting that question. Um, all right, next. Anyone else? Yep. Base of the pyramid. We are moving into the Maya section of the panel. All right, next. Project finance. Project finance. finance. All right, that, um, we may get to that. We may punt that. And if so, we'll talk with you afterwards about it. Um, those two. No, yet yeah, you. I. Collaboration. Collaboration. Versus territorial. Versus territorial. Thank you. And behind you. Role of the capital markets. I guarantee we will get to that one. What are those? <laughs> <laughs> Professor Chen will take that. Uh, yes. <laughs> Okay, domestic versus emerging markets. Um, one last one. Anyone, any final one? All the way over there. Job opportunities for millennials. Ah. <laughs> uh, Ron, you have a millennial. Uh, for millennials. Okay, um, so let's stick a pin in that and. Um, let me start with this, um, Fran. Mm. Ten years ago, 
uh, we couldn't even agree on what impact was, let alone whether it was an industry. Um, now you're running an industry organization. Um, how did we get here, and how easy was it? How long do you have, Mark? <laughs> Two minutes, but the timer's not running. I, I've so noticed take that, that we have a perpetual you... hour on the timer, so I guess we'll just get going. Yeah. Um, so, ten years ago, so it was like mid-year or fall 2007. Am I talking too loud, too? Okay. Um, mid 2007. So I, at that time, was writing a private placement memorandum for an impact fund that sought to be market rate. Um, addressing three segments, sustainability, um, health and wellness, and um, medical technology. And we were really early. I was telling Dave, I went to Boston to visit with Cambridge Associates in like Q4 of 2007, and maybe that was right around the time that they launched their impact investing practice yep. at the behest of a couple of foundations, some of which Dave has worked with, Meyer Memorial Trust, um, Annie E. Casey, Heron Foundation, and Rockefeller Foundation. And um, it, was a, it was a tough meeting. <laughs> um, they had not developed their uh, practice as yet, and it was just super early days, and of course, the financial crisis was nigh. Um, and we've come an extraordinary, extraordinarily long way. On the other hand, you know, microfinance had been going on in emerging markets since the mid-70s. Community Development Finance Shore Bank was started in the 70s. So sometimes I think that we feel like, you know, the, the term was coined um, around 2000, 2008. Um, and that that was the beginning of impact investing. But investing with values has been going on since the 18th and 19th centuries with the Lutherans and the Methodists. Um, oh, you're going academic, aren't you? you? Oh, you didn't ask for the last 100 years? <laughs> you asked for 10? Pro Professor Siegel has arrived. <laughs> um, yeah, but, but things have evolved tremendously since mm. then. Um, I feel like the ecosystem as we know it has evolved, and I'm looking forward to talking about like, and about it. Did, ten years ago, um, if we had, if we had said this is where we'll be, there is an industry association, and it covers this broad spectrum of the impact economy. Would you have considered that success or not? Maybe. I mean, I look back, and I feel like in some ways we are building the the tools and mechanisms and players that move the capital market, move money in the capital mm -hmm. markets and the standard capital markets. So we have, you know, investors from retail to institutional. We have private companies and public company CEOs who want that capital. We have the connective tissue of a range of intermediaries as well as um, fund managers. And then we have, you know, generally accepted accounting principles mm -hmm. and all the things, you know, Morningstar and, and um, and an S&P and all the things that allow the money to move. And uh, I think we've made tremendous progress in developing some of those mechanisms to help capital flow. And I think we have a ways to go as well. Mm. All right, so Ron, when you first started exploring impact in what you've described as your second act, um, after building uh, some of the best companies in the world and then started looking to build companies that were best for the world, um, when you started, if you had taken where we were then, which is roughly 2007, 2008, somewhere in there, right? Yep. And I had told you, this is where we'd be right now. Um, what would you have thought? Were we successful? Were we not successful? Is it slower than you thought? Is it faster than you thought? Do you wish you had never met me back in DC way back when? <laughs> well, that last one is too long of a question to answer. But, uh, I thought it would be simple. There are two letters in it. So having had a little time to think about it um, since Mark first posed this, this question, I actually would have thought we would have been further along. And maybe it's because I'm a natural optimist that when I got in, I sold my traditional investment management company in 2006. Uh, my wife Marty and I started a foundation. Uh, we began impact investing in 07. We were really early at the time, you know, before the field was even named appropriately. Um, but I. I am disappointed in many ways that we have not had more capital moved, particularly 
and the private side, the direct impact type of investments that we focused in in our foundation. And I think as I look at the prime reason for that, I don't think it's a lack of demand or I don't think it's actually a lack of supply of quality products. I think a lot of it is still the ecosystem and the infrastructure. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that the advisory industry, the intermediaries, have not yet fully embraced how to move capital in this space. And so that's disappointing because that's the industry I came out of and where I thought I could perhaps play a role, and I think I have with Impact Assets and some others, and trying to move advisors this direction. So I'll say with that as a backdrop, I do feel like there has been a real paradigm change in the advisor space. I think 10 years ago, when I first started talking to investment advisors, many of whom, hundreds of whom I knew and had worked with about impact investing, the question I would get is what? What is that? Many times they'd say, oh, impact investing, that's microfinance. And I'd say, well, it is, but it's also dozens and dozens of other things. But there was just not even a basic understanding of what impact investing was. Yeah. Fast forward five years, I think we went, the paradigm moved from a what to a why. Five years ago, it's like, okay, I get it. This field, it's more than microfinance. I understand there's a whole variety of different ways to deploy capital for impact. That's great. I'm starting to read about it. But my clients aren't asking for it yet. And inherent in that conversation was none of them, or very few of them at the time, were actually trying to introduce clients to it. It was very reactionary. I think fast forward now to where we're at today, 10 years later, and we've gone from what to why to how. If you're at a big firm today, chances are pretty good you've had a number of clients that have brought it up. Chances are also pretty good you may have lost a meaningful client because you haven't been able to satisfy them. And there's nothing that encourages action at one of these firms than losing a client. So I really do believe the conversations are now, people get what impact investing is. They have begun to understand that there is indeed interest, a growing interest certainly among millennials, among women asset owners, all of that is showing up in the studies that are being done. And so firms are now beginning to ask in a much more serious nature, how do we get engaged? How do we do this as a firm? So that's a very positive development, but it's still under the umbrella that these firms, the biggest firms, are very bureaucratic and they are tankers that move very slowly. So it's, um, again, I, I, to answer your question directly, I would have thought we would have moved a lot more capital 10 years ago, but I'm beginning to realize that big paradigm shifts take time. We're changing some fundamental kind of assumptions about the way people think about capital, and that's not an easy thing to do, but I think that there has been a lot of great work done by folks on this panel particularly over the last 10 years that will end up bearing fruit moving forward. All right, and so Dave, um, as Ron said, we're essentially, we're now at the point where pretty much every institutional investor has at least heard of impact investing, um, if not moved yet. Um, and you're in the institutional space. What's been the biggest surprise to you over the last 10 years? And I also realize that I met you and Ron at the same event. Uh, so this is like everything coming full circle. So what's been the biggest surprise over the last 10 years? A, a lot of the discussion about impact investing takes place around the high net worth and the high net worth private banking advisory and the ultra high net worth family offices. And we chose a fairly different strategy in about 2010 and 11 that was going after large scale institutional investors. So think about pension plans and sovereign wealth funds. And I think the biggest surprise, well, I'll give you a little story. Uh, two weeks ago, I was sitting across the table from a uh, portfolio manager that, uh, that allocates about $30 billion in real estate mm -hmm. for a 200, actually not dollars, 20, 30 billion euro portfolio of real estate in a 250 billion euro pension plan. So anyone know what the exchange rate is right now? I'm trying to do math and, on stage, that's dangerous. And we were talking about some of our strategies and, and he looked at me and he said, well, do you think that qualifies as impact investing? Now, a few years ago, I think that would have been a, a question that would be basically, do you go in bucket A or bucket B? And bucket B would be, we don't allocate there. 
And, and in this case, he was asking the question, do you qualify to help me with my impact investing protocol, mm -hmm. and do you help me with my SDG protocol? And your answer, because you've talked about this at SOCAP before, was what? These strategies are impactful, but if you categorize impact investing as concessionary, no, because these are alpha generating strategies. But if you're asking, do they help generate a deliberate impact on society, the answer is yes. All right, so what's the, what's the biggest surprise? Is it how long it's taken? It's, is it that you're getting asked these questions? I mean, I think the biggest surprise is the fact that you have a $30 billion asset allocator of a major top 20 pension plan in the world talking to you meaningfully, intelligently, and, and with, a, with a very sophisticated understanding of impact. That's a, and, that's a difference. And, and, I and would is contrast that progress? That, and I would contrast that to what's happening in the RIA space and in the private wealth space. This guy is not asking a question of how, why, He's already thinking that he's deploying to it, and he's asking, do you qualify? I'm looking for new products and new strategies to do this. And that sounds like progress. It, it's industry. huge progress. I think the other thing that, as an impact investor uh, fund manager, that you have to really appreciate is that over the course of the last few years, uh, a almost classic m business school market segmentation has taken place. There is the conversation around impact, and in the institution, many of the same kinds of concepts are bundled and, 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 and spoken about in a very different market segmentation, which is really sustainable finance or sustainability. And, and the meaningful difference is that when we talk about impact investing, there's a concept that my money can do more. When you're talking to an institution, it's not about my money can do more. It's about what's the risk management of these trends and what's the opportunity set of these trends. That's a very different perspective of looking at the issue. So a market segmentation in the last 10 years has taken place. A way of approaching these impactful opportunity has taken place. And I think the biggest surprise is the amount of capital that these institutions are allocating to this. I think that's right. So speaking of large allocations of capital, um, so Maya, you spent basically your career at the leading edge of investing in developing economies. Uh, and that's, Ron, when you were doing microfinance and people were talking to you about impact investing, oh, that's microfinance, oh, that's developing economies. Um, and now you're a partner in the largest impact fund that's been raised to date. Have the economics of impact always supported funds of this size, or has like, something fundamentally changed in the industry over the last 10 years? Um, I, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very good question, and I think um, with respect to fund sizes, there, there are a couple of considerations. One is in the early days of impact, um, what we were doing were, in many cases, largely seen as experiments, which is why the family offices and, and the high net worth individuals came to the table to take that risk. And a lot of the work that was started was in the venture space, and to do well in venture, it's better, it's better to be smaller than, than bigger, because you can stay more disciplined you know, if you're smaller. Um, the economics are tough, to be frank, for small funds. I think that one of the, the, the frustrations that a lot of the impact GPs had is that with fund sizes of anywhere between you know, 20 and 100 million, um, it was a challenge to uh, do the work with the level of rigor and integrity that we all wanted to bring to the table. We did that work, but we did it at huge um, pay cuts and, you know, sacrificing on um, our own sort of personal well-being because we worked extremely hard, you know, we flew economy all over the world um, and slept in, you know, cars overnight rather than, you know, a hotel room because we just had to do things cheaply in order to do the work well. As you, um, as you look at the evolution of the, um, of the industry in the last 10 years, I think what has borne out is that, number one, the early theses that we had, which I think Dave articulates ex extremely well, which is for those of us who came from an investing um, background, there was a very strong sense that we had that 
we would actually generate alpha by approaching our work in the way that we did, which is if you look at situations that enhance environmental or social returns or social value, that value would accrue back to the shareholders at the end of the day. And that you had to be very thoughtful and very practiced at this work. And what we've also found um, over time is that these are not necessarily niche plays, that there are um, more spaces than you can think about where uh, doing strategies at scale are possible. So the sizing of funds, I think, was less about um, a definitive um, condition of the industry than this was a nascent space. Often when you're nascent, you start small. Once you start to prove out, you, you see um, the, the patterns that are out there in the world, and slowly, 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 you start to build the kind of track record that makes uh, capital more comfortable with, with coming to the table because our internal perception of risk um, and return, which wasn't necessarily understood or shared with, with external LPs, started to prove itself out. And, and that, was, that was an important part of, of getting, to, getting to larger size Dave, in the industry. Dave, I see you nodding. Is, that, is it that there's now almost a scientific validation of the methodology, or is it just here, here are returns, this can be done, it's not all about Milton Friedman or what you think he said? Well, I, I think the, 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 the big change that's taken place, and Ron mentioned this, and that is that when we all got started 10 years ago, uh, impact investing was more or less relegated to or defined by two or three words. One was uh, social venture capital, mm -hmm. second one was microfinance, and a predisposition to emerging country. Yeah. All right? And, and what has come about is, wow, there's a lot of ways of generating societal and environmental impact. There's a ton of quote unquote market failures across environmental and social. And in those kinds of words, there are opportunities to create investment vehicles uh, that, that, um, uh, that are impactful legitimately and, and substantively. When you start to open that up, it means every asset class has the opportunity to be impactful. And there are asset classes when we chose as a firm to avoid venture capital and go right after the real assets categories. And, and real assets are things like uh, real estate, uh, sustainable land management and agriculture, uh, uh, renewable resources, including water and energy. Well, those are all categories that are measured, and it's not unusual to raise a two, three, four billion dollar fund around that. And, and so we chose purposely large categories that could have direct impact where uh, they were large categories that institutional investors were already very comfortable allocating to, and they had expectations of returns. And there were known benchmarks for many of these categories of returns. And so, so that allowed us then to, to build products bespoke for those categories, those asset classes, and for that kind of investor and then to go after investors that could allocate in $50 million pieces, $100 million pieces. We just recently announced our, our second, uh, the second ag fund, the closing of that product. That was $550 million, and our largest single investor was $100 million. All right. So going back 10 years, yeah, go ahead. Well, it just occurs to me that we're talking a lot about institutional investors, mm -hmm. and Ron was talking about wealth advisors and high net worth individuals, and just want to make a small shout out to the retail investor. Uh, and um, I, was about, I was about to ask, and this is sort of to me where the capital markets question from earlier comes in. So what is the role of the retail investor? What are the opportunities? What do we need more of to sort mm -hmm. of engage that, that group of mm -hmm. potential investors? So if you look at pension funds mm -hmm. um, in the United States, there is a move away from defined benefit to defined contribution. So defined benefit was our parents' version of a pension where you got a defined payout in perpetuity, um, where there was a centralized management of assets which could be sophisticated enough and be thoughtful enough in terms of payout to take a long-term bet in a TPG rise or an equilibrium fund. Um, more and more assets are moving towards something called defined contribution, which are 401k plans, uh, 403b plans, um, IRAs, and the like. 
And that really shifts the onus of asset allocation and perception of risk and pricing of risk and reward to the retail investor. Now, of course, your 401k uh, plan administrator certainly diligences and makes things available to you. I, I recently did a keynote at a defined contribution symposium that was um, hosted by Institutional Investor. And I really see that market as aggregated retail. And so I talked a lot about ESG funds, so public funds, so index funds, ETFs, and mutual funds, um, less on the private side, because that's really mostly what's available to retail investors. I think there's a huge opportunity, and we're starting to see some innovation around customized ESG screens. I've been very interested in the rise of robo-investors, whether it be a um, aspiration or open invest or swell investing that are doing like super customized things at very low minimums for retail investors. Um, but I also think that there's an opportunity to democratize access to privates. Um, you might have a publicly traded affordable housing fund. Um, there may be different ways to get access to donor advised funds and others. So I see just to kind of hold the fort down around uh, the retail investor and the average investor, um, I think that there's a lot of innovation that we've seen over the last 10 years and much more to be done. Yep. All right. So, Ron, uh, two questions in one. One, this is sort of your old world. Uh, building products for advisors who can then go to whether it's high net worth or retail investors. Uh, two, does ESG count as impact? If we're having a public markets conversation, does ESG count as part of the impact conversation? So let me answer the second one first, and, and it's been an evolution for me actually, because when we first, as a foundation, got into impact investing, we looked at it entirely on the direct impact private side. Frankly, that's where, that's where all the fun stuff was, right? The, the opportunity to, whether it was in our case, uh, women and girls is a big part of our portfolio. So investing in women-owned businesses and microfinance, et cetera. And it wasn't actually until we had uh, our millennial leadership join our foundation team in 2014 that they began to ask the question of why aren't we 100% invested for impact? And we, among other foundations, made the commitment in 2014 and that actually involved us moving the public side. So I've come to the conclusion that this private and public side, you know, people think maybe we're at odds with each other. It's all part of the same continuum. And the way I look at it is any investment that you make has impact. And that impact is going to be across a scale from positive to negative. On the public side, it's possible to really have what I consider collective impact as opposed to direct impact because your dollars aren't necessarily as accretive as they are on the private side, but combined with other dollars, particularly with the right investment managers who can influence corporate behavior, those dollars in ESG can really have collective impact. And so I look at it all as being part of the same equation. Uh, we encourage other asset owners and foundations to think about how to go 100% impact, and that doesn't mean you have to invest 100% in private deals, but it means you have some allocation across both public and private. Uh, now, having said that, I forgot your first question. <laughs> well, I didn't really mean it anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, no, what's the, what's the role of the capital markets? I mean, did, or let me rephrase what I asked. Um, what's the role of investment advisors, the, the client base that you used to serve uh, in your old role? So I think there's an... If, if, if we're going to get to the asset owners, there's an incredibly important role for the intermediaries. And I, I said for years that with respect to impact investing, these gatekeepers were often arbitrarily keeping the gates closed. Can I ask you one question? Because I realize that over the last 10 years, one of the things that's been consistent is we say the role of intermediaries, and then we never really get to defining what an intermediary is. Um, can you give me your definition of an intermediary? So I would say an intermediary is a person or a company that stands between the actual mm -hmm. investor and whatever that investment is, an individual deal, a product, a fund, et cetera. So for most of, at least in the U.S., those intermediaries consist of a series of brokerage firms and wealth management firms who you know, do, a, I think, a noble service, if done correctly, helping people plan for retirement, et cetera, and manage their assets. And those are the folks that need to be engaged for there to be a real movement of capital into impact investing. 
And I think I had originally thought that they could be motivated directly by this opportunity. And I've now come to the conclusion that that motivation has to come from client interest. And it's coming from client interest. Clients are going to their advisor and saying, I know people that are doing this. I've been reading about it. I'd like to get engaged. I'd like my capital to have more impact. And again, that's causing the industry to kind of move from that what or, or why to what to how. All right. uh, my, so from your position now, what, where, where do the capital markets come in? Is it, retail investors aren't investing in the Rise Fund or the Rise Fund 2 or 3 or 4. Um, are they investing in companies that come out of the Rise portfolio and go public? Is it just you're looking at private equity so there's never an opportunity? What's the, how do you think about the role of the capital markets and what you're doing now? I, I, I think, I mean, a, a, lot of, a lot of how I see the capital markets is linked to um, the Rise Fund being a growth equity fund where exits are going to come, you know, partially from um, IPOs, which will give, uh, you know, retail investors an opportunity to own stocks of impact companies. It also comes in the form of uh, debt financing. I think that over the course of the last few years, we've seen um, a number of efforts um, uh, by groups such as Wellington, BlackRock, um, a few others who have tried to construct uh, effectively uh, public company um, funds that are a, an amalgamation of what, what they would define as impact companies. So the challenge is, is that their definition of an impact company may be different from yours. The way Wellington's product looks uh, is very different from, from BlackRock's product. But I think that, um, you know, on the one hand, capital markets are going to continue to play a traditional role in um, funding and providing capital to companies that are impactful, but that the leading edge of that will likely come from the mainstream rather than from the impact side, meaning that um, a lot of the impact funds are still, you know, venture funds, and they're not, um, uh, pr you know, they're not in the in the companies long enough now um, for those com most of, in most cases to go to go public. Although, you know, I'll, I'll cite my own. Um, experience at, at Elevar where, you know, from our first fund, which invested in seven companies, two companies went public, which is, so that, you know, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, I'm underselling um, the opportunity. But I or think... Or over-indexing on success. Yeah, or over-indexing <laughs> on success. But I, I, I do see um, a demand um, from investors, and I think it's going to grow with the millennials to be investing in companies for whom they know and understand the values and the good that is being produced for the world. And I think over time, we're going to see and seed more of those companies. And so there, there, is a, there is an organic path towards growing sort of what I'll call capital markets activity in these kinds of companies. And there's also a couple of examples now where um, Laureate Education was the first benefit corporation that went public. Um, Etsy, a B yeah. uh, corporation is public now. Um, we have some uh, public company subsidiaries like Ben & Jerry's that has a B certification. And Kathy Clark mentioned earlier today that Natura, which is a Brazilian, publicly traded Brazilian um, uh, company, just uh, acquired uh, Body Shop. Mm. Um, so, uh, and that, she said that that was the first time that uh, uh, a B Corp had acquired a non-B Corp. And so I think we're starting to see some infiltration into... So 10 years ago, this was almost the exact inverse when Unilever acquired Ben & Jerry's. That right. was like, that was roughly 10 years ago, right? 12, somewhere yeah, in there? Yeah, it might have been about 10 years yeah. ago, and that was seen as kind of a... Um, uh, uh, an impact fail. I taught this right, the class, yeah. like an impact yeah. failure, where yeah. a bunch of jobs got, you know, in, in Vermont went away, and um, a lot of the sustainable um, uh, supply chain uh, went away. And I almost think that it's been fascinating. It's almost like an impact turnaround, where mm -hmm. the impact kind of leaked out of, of Ben and Jerry's, and now it's been reinvigorated and it almost kind of is bubbling up to Unilever and Paul Pullman is doing some interesting stuff. So I, I, I think we start seeing some more activity in the public and the public markets. And I make the distinction between like what Wellington is doing and others. They're investing in the what, like these companies are impactful 
um, I'll be them public, versus the how, which I think is ESG is very much about the, the practices of a public company. And so, you know, piggybacking off of Ron's sort of, you know, set of questions, um, I think that there is some trans slow transformation happening in the public markets. Mm -hmm. um, Dave, are there, are there yet or will there be um, public sustainable real assets mutual funds? Is, is there a role for the capital markets in sustainable real assets or not? Sure. <laughs> is that a good outcome or not? Does it matter? No, I mean, I, I, think, I think you're asking you know, a couple of things. One is, will the capital markets take illiquid assets and convert them into ETFs and, and other more liquid forms? Yes. You know, I, I think there's something that, but I, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask. And, 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 you know, if you look at what's happened in the last 10 years, and maybe I'm being way too optimistic, but many of the issues and opportunities that we've talked about actually, I think, have shown a jumping of the chasm into the mainstream. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, I, I think about things as profoundly impactful as GPIF, which most people in this room have never heard of. GPIF is the pension plan for uh, the Japanese public employees. Mm -hmm. That's a trillion dollars. All right? And the CIO of the pension plan was asked about two years ago on a panel uh, at uh, the Milken Institute, uh, hey, what's the role of, of climate change in your portfolio thinking of a trillion dollars? A trillion dollars. Not trillion in, in exaggerated terms, but a trillion, and that's what his responsibility is. And he said, well, in a very Japanese way, he sort of gave a profound answer, and he said, uh, what good is a pension check when it's 117 degrees Fahrenheit outside? And, and since the time that he talked about that, he has basically pushed GPIF into a very strong ESG and sustainability-oriented track. And so this is the largest pool of capital in Japan. And the rest of the capital pool is following what GPIF said. Right? Now, that doesn't necessarily mean they know what to do with it, but they are no longer asking the question, gosh, should we? Yeah. All right. And these are profound changes. I mean, these are profound, all right? And so one of the things that I think that we don't talk about in this field at all is we, we assume that as we hit the mainstream, this is just goodness, all right? Well, I think there's two things that we have to consider as we hit the mainstream. One is the bar's been raised, all right? It's, I, don't, I don't mean to be pejorative in any way, but, but it's, it's one thing to raise a $20 million fund. It's another one to sit down and try to raise a $2 billion fund, all right? And, and, and you're managing $2 billion in the form of For the record, fund. he's pointing at Maya, not at me. Maya. <laughs> and, and, and we're managing $2 billion across a family of funds, all right? And that, the stakes are just higher. The expectations are higher, all right? And I think if there's one thing that, that we see across this sector is the the game's changed, and the game is now much, we're not part of cute, fuzzy, furry, forest animal with big eyes, okay, <laughs> that we get the you pet. like your socks? Yeah. Like my socks. <laughs> yeah. right. um, but, uh, but we're now part of the capital markets, which means you left the uh, little kid table at Thanksgiving and you went to the big people table, <laughs> okay? And so you're expected to act like a big person. For those of you looking for a tweetable moment, it has just happened. Uh, so, uh, impact investing at the big people table. So I think that's one thing. I think the flip side of this is that as we hit mainstream, uh, greenwashing, what are the right guardrails, how do you actually define this stuff? Not in a very theoretical sense. So I, I'll, again, I'll, I'll, maybe, I don't mean to sound critical, but for the last 10 years we've talked about metrics almost in a theoretical construct because there was nothing to measure. All right? And today, we're now starting to see the first frameworks that actually are very professional framework, mm -hmm. capital markets oriented, like TCFD, that most people in the impact space probably haven't heard of. All right. Explain. TCFD is, is, is basically a framework that speaks about, very narrowly, climate change in the language of risk and opportunity so that a portfolio manager can actually start to think about their portfolio and fund managers can actually start talking about it that way, okay? The SDGs are probably one of the biggest shocks of, of the last couple of years, okay? Which is, who the hell would have ever thought that, 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 that 
global 500 CEOs would actually be talking about SDGs on their quarterly conference calls, and that portfolio managers would be, the portfolio owners would be asking, how do you help my SDG? Hmm. Uh, do you remember, were there, how many panels were there last year here on the SDGs? They're not, uh, I mean, that's, that's like, that happened in, in the last year. year. Yeah. That's um, just not, it's true. So the metrics conversation, Ron. Um, what do you when you think about metrics for your portfolio? What are you trying to measure? Are you trying to measure everything? Do you have a set of narrow things that you're looking for? Um, when people ask you for advice on metrics, what do you say? Other than that, advice is worth what you pay for it. So I would say that if we're particularly looking at our private impact portfolio, whether it's direct deals or funds. Mm -hmm. I would first say that, that metrics are hard. Metrics, it, it, it is still more art than science, and that is notwithstanding some really great work that's being led by a lot of organizations, including the gym and B-Labs, et cetera, but it's, these things are still hard to measure. So I remember uh, seven years ago at Impact Assets, and Fran Siegel was with us then when we created the Impact Assets 50 database of investment managers. And we tried to come up with the first publicly available database of investment managers who were in the impact investment space. We had hundreds of managers apply because they, they'd heard about this space and they wanted to be in it. And it was Jed Emerson, who was part of our strategy team, who kind of helped us develop the concept of a firm's impact capacity, right? And this idea that a firm was committed to impact by being committed to measuring it, by being transparent about it, and that was the starting point, and a lot of good work has happened since with the gears and some other things. But I, I would say that we don't get hung up on, we don't get overly hung up on the metrics. We want to understand what these firms are doing. We want to understand that whether it's an individual company or a, um, a fund, that they have a thesis for impact of what they're trying to accomplish, that they've got a way of measuring that impact and that they're transparent about the measurement. And we realize that some of those measurements are going to be more difficult and some are gonna be easier. And so Ron's measuring it on the private side, foundation, essentially family office. Uh, you're measuring it in a large private equity fund, basically. What's the difference? Um, I, I think that the base intent is the same, which is we wanna be able to um, demonstrate and um, manage uh, our understanding of the impact that we hope the companies we invest in are creating and you know the, the old adage if you don't if you don't measure you can't you can't manage towards it at our level we created a, a very deep methodology that really speaks to the analytical um, underpinnings of a private equity firm so we we couldn't be intuitive we couldn't be fuzzy about our approach to impact, you know, from an SEC perspective, when, a, when an investment opportunity comes to the table, how do we know within TPG whether it's a, it's a deal that goes to the RISE fund versus a deal that just goes to TPG growth? You cannot be fuzzy with the SEC. You have to tell them you're not cherry picking deals as you want for each fund. You have to have a methodology. And so we built a very deep framework that um, uh, importantly links to the UN SDGs as our definition of impact that looks at academic research, third party research and real calibration um, by, by mostly academics, people like J-PAL on what impact has been created by the um, products and services delivered by healthcare interventions or financial services interventions. And then we score that and we, we use that as our, our deep methodology. And I think the one uh, beauty of the RISE Fund is that because of its size, we were able to bring resources to the table to do this work that, again, back to your small fund question, a $20 million impact fund doesn't have the resourcing to do. And so we had an army of people with Bridgespan and internally um, at TPG and you know with Elevar, my old, my old firm, do this work and it is very dynamic. It still is more of an art, although we are trying to make it more scientific and more analytical and, and that's how we're pushing our, our approach forward. But as the impact economy has grown, it's sort of proved the action. It's really hard to scale an economy if you keep asking people to do things for free all the yeah. time. Yes. Um, and so it starts looking like an industry. All right, so we've got 15 minutes left. Um, we're gonna do some audience questions. There are microphones over there, so raise your hand. A mic 
raise your hand, a microphone will come to you, and then we'll have questions. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, my name's Melanie, I'm from Empowerment Works, and I have a broader question about regulations in our whole movement, considering what happened at Standing Rock with DAPL and um, the legal frameworks that allow a lot of bad impact investing or really um, extractive investing. How, can our, how has this movement um, been working or succeeded in any way of leveling the playing field to make all investments um, more conscious and less harmful. Dave, let me, would you, um, and, and one of, I think one of the places to look to is sort of the EU and what it's done on data collection and reporting, but more broadly, you've worn a ton of hats and seen the industry from a bunch of different perspectives. What's, has anything happened of a regulatory nature that's been positive over the past 10 years? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's at least three pieces of work, uh, legis uh, regulation that I think, uh, and legislation that I think people should be absolutely aware of. That I, I think, frankly, they're monstrous changes and they're incredibly geeky and minute, but they're incredibly monstrous in terms of, of their impact. One was ERISA clarification, all right? I mean, that was just huge. And, 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 like and, and, and industry and I, changed overnight and no one heard. Right, right, and I joke that it took them two years to write three sentences, okay? But, but they're incredibly important yeah. sentences. And, and the three sentences basically amount to mm -hmm. you're a fiduciary of a corporate pension plan. You don't get to get off the hook. You're still obligated. Mm -hmm. However, uh, many things like ESG kinds of principles, they couldn't use the word climate change, okay? Mm -hmm are material changes, and if they're material, you get to consider those as part of your fiduciary duty, all right? So ERISA was hugely important. I, I don't think uh, we should underestimate the importance of the benefit corporation laws, mm -hmm. especially the fact that it got passed in Delaware. I'm on the board of directors of B Corp, and there was no way that we thought that this thing would have mm -hmm. passed any time this decade in I, Delaware, all right? And, and I remember happened. when it first came across my desk in government trying yeah. to figure out where to root it. Yeah. And, and it, it isn't about the B, and it isn't about, you know, the kinds of things that we think about that are very marketing and green oriented. It's about fundamentally that the fiduciary can choose the protection of the law if in fact they make a decision weighing not just the shareholder, but the environment, their employees and their community and seek the protection of the law in making that decision. That's a monstrous rollback of Revlon, all right? And, and, and then the third is the IRS clarifications that took mm -hmm. place a few years ago with, again, with regard to fiduciary duty and what's inbounds and out of bounds. So, so a lot's actually changed in this country. And I would say, just, it wasn't just two years. You can go back to 2010 when we first kicked off the impact investing policy process in the federal government. Um, the IRS thing and the ERISA thing were part of the very first convening that we had, and it took until the very tail end of the previous administration to get it done. It, regulation's not easy. Regulation is not easy, and both of these um, bearings on fiduciary duty came out in Q4 of 2015. So while they were small language additions or tweaks, they were very hard won, one thing, and that's something that took, the risk mm -hmm. reform took 10 years. Um, one of the things the Alliance, which I run, is, is working on is trying to put some of those policies into action because we have talked in our field so much about ERISA reform for a long time, and now that it's passed, how can we help catalyze more flows of capital um, into impact and give uh, uh, pension fund fiduciaries and foundation fiduciaries the comfort that they need to allocate capital for impact. So I'm, I'm just saying, like writing the regulations and passing, you know, passing tax credits, that's one thing, but actually m moving policy into action is something different and important. Yeah. Um, so, all right, let's go to the next question. Uh, where's the microphone? Right there. Thank you. I just had one quick question in, um, I've heard, like, I love hearing all of this stuff about how the progress of impact nesting where it's going to go in the next ge decade. What's been on my mind is, do you see any place? Can you speak up? Oh yeah, do you see any way where, any ways that impact investing could go beyond the mark or what, places we should avoid going into into the future? Any danger zones for impact investing in general as, as a sector? Yeah. 
risk, Maya, do you see risks anywhere? Yeah. I mean, I went to law yeah. school, so that's a <laughs> you see risks I don't practice everywhere. law, but yeah, I was <laughs> no, trained I, for I, that. No, I think, I think, um, I think there, there, are two, there are two risks uh, that I'd, I'd like to speak about. One is, um, in this whole effort that we've been um, working on to segment the market, there, there still is fuzziness. There's fuzziness around whether certain funds and certain strategies are what I'll call market rate return or not. And sometimes I think there's naivete on the part of fund managers who think that they can deliver a market rate return and think that there's a sort of silver bullet about impact investing and they actually don't know how to do it. So one very big existential risk is we're, we're loose about segmenting the market and um, we have managers at the table who have all of the optimism and the good um, intention in the world but don't actually have the skills to identify what kind of capital is appropriate for what segment and whether, um, you know, whether, whether they can achieve that. I think the second risk is, is on impact measurement. If we keep going for a lot longer without being crisp about how we identify impact, how we monitor impact, how we manage towards impact, and how we um, understand uh, whether we've delivered the impact we had, uh, intended, this will all flow away. I think all of us want to live in a world where impact is no longer such a thing and it's just part of the capital markets and that the understanding of risk in portfolio management and portfolio theory incorporates social and environmental costs, which it does not do well today. That's sort of a lot of the work that we want to do. But if we do not figure out how to describe and explain the social and environmental value, you know, the value of externalities, and if we don't, you know, deliver on that, um, we'll have egg on our face in uh, 10 did, years. Did you did I understand you right to say that optimism alone is not a business plan? <laughs> Did, uh, uh, Ron, uh, here's another thing that I think we've been talking about as an industry for like the last 10 years and doesn't always get defined. What does market rate mean? 11.3%. <laughs> is it different by asset class? Completely, yeah. I, no. so, so I think that... Um, well, I mean, in investing, there's this concept of an efficient frontier that for every level of risk that you're willing to take, there's an appropriate level of return that you should receive. Mm -hmm. So I think that's lost on many investors who look at market rate and think it should be a particular number or a range. And it really ranges, you know, the market rate today on cash is pretty close to zero, yeah. where the market rate on early stage venture investments in the emerging markets is double digit. So. Um, you know, I, I, that, that's, so that's a long way of saying there is not a simple answer to market rate. It really depends upon what investment you're looking at. Yeah, yeah I just worry a, a little bit about this kind of slavish devotion to this idea of market rate and risk-adjusted rates of return, when in actuality, if you look at the history of returns of certain asset classes, including venture capital, there hasn't really been a risk premium uh, above, the, cap above the, the public market. So from mid-1990s to mid-2000s, venture capital as an asset class underperformed the S&P, and early stage, which is supposed to deliver even a, a premium above the overall asset class, underperformed. And so um, I always, I feel sometimes when we speak with gatekeepers that there's a double standard, that somehow as impact investors, we are, as fund managers, we're expect to actually, expected to have premium rates of return for the risk as well as you know, this very precise measure of impact. And I just, I think it's like a, a double standard and um, that, that can be frustrating for fund managers. Dave, how do you fix it? I won't add anything at all to, to what's been said about market rate and, and all that. I, I will say that there's another dimension of market segmentation that has taken place. And, and as much as there's a segmentation of institutional, retail, uh, high net worth, there's also, I think, an increasing sophistication around the language of what form of capital are you. So there is going to be distinctly a set of fund managers that are going to be uh, uh, positioning their product as market rate appropriate to their asset class and appropriate to their risk level. There are some that are going to position the fact that they will outperform because they're spotting inefficiencies in the market. There's that. But I think one of the things that's most interesting is 
I was talking to Deb Schwartz at, at MacArthur the other day, and she's a good friend of ours, and you know, and, and the sophistication that they're coming to is there is an inefficient frontier, all right, which is that in an early stage of a market, all right, uh, and not necessarily uh, an early stage company. It's very careful, not, not early stage, but early stage of a market. Uh, Stormwater utility and credit trading is an early stage market. And they acknowledge that early stage markets need the help of folks that will run into that breach all right, and that challenge and help make it happen so that the proper capital markets can then become efficient. All right, that, that, that's a very sophisticated way of understanding what's their role. I'm going to play a role that no one else will play and that is critically important for the capital markets to take shape. That's what happened with microfinance. Exactly. So everybody likes to think of, of the Nobel Prize and, and Muhammad Yunus and and they forget the prior 30 years of toiling in quiet desperation. And subsidy. Where it was a heavily subsidized yeah. field. And you were a pioneer in the market transition period. So you got the ride on top of 30, 30 years, years of toiling in quiet desperation. Yeah. Right? But that's the role you play. Yeah. Right? And I think that, that one of the most interesting sophistications that's taken place in this field is for us to understand the time dimension. There's this, there's this very, very naive notion. Today, I will declare this to be a market, okay? Boom, now start trading. That's not a power that you have? No, it is. it's a power no one has. Now start trading, okay? And, 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 and there's this like 20 years of stuff that happens to happen before that. Well, someone's got to pay for that, all right? And there's no way that you can have an efficient capital market before that set of rules takes place. All right, so speaking of time dimension, last question, quick, Eric. Or uh, we got, well, all right. Uh, Person okay. we don't know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right, no, behind Eric. Go ahead. You, yeah, yes. with the microphone, yes. holding the microphone. Yes, you. Yeah. Yes, you. Okay, yeah. I, I appreciate it, appreciate it. Robert Powell. Uh, quick question, Ron. I know you had mentioned it. Loud, right. loud and fast. Yes, Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, so with Ron, you mentioned with the uh, intermediaries uh, being very slow to move. Uh, my, my question is, um, I guess, they're moving when the retail uh, side of the, of the business has the demand, they ask for it. So then you see the intermediary slowly moving with investment vehicles that are uh, impactful. So how can you increase the demand from the public uh, for wanting those types of vehicles? What are some solutions to increasing that knowledge, getting that message out to the everyday average common person? Do, do you have any, do you think there's any solutions out there for that? Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. let, let me put it, just hold, hold that thought, Eric, 15 seconds. Now, in the last 10 years, I'm just wondering, what's been one of your most uh, funnest memories working in the impact investing space? Well, I met you. That was good. Um, okay. Uh, more, more demand, which is really 10 years from now. On, on the movement yeah. building side? Yeah. How do you create more demand? Yeah. Yeah. Where so, are we 10 years so from now? One of the things we're working on is, uh, is bottom-up movement building, which I think is what you're talking about. So our theory of change at the Alliance is at the intersection of some top-down levers like policy and moving institutional pots of capital like these guys have been talking about, and bottom-up movement building, we can get to a tipping point. And so I think part of it is happening with the wealth transfer to women and millennials who are just proportionately interested in impact. I think millennials as a generation, uh, of which I am not one, um, hmm. uh, has a, a demand and an expectation for transparency through technology and kind of low marginal costs. And I think that um, moving toward a place where you have impact transparency, um, that's something that we're working toward is impact, invest, impact transparency as an investor right, so that we're not prescriptive about what impact you might seek, but to at least know what you're investing in, whether it be a public security or a, a, a private market investment. And so I think that the confluence of, you know, the proliferation of technology, the demand for transparency, and the rise of the millennials, will, it will happen. All right, so let's, en let's end on this. 30 seconds each. Uh, 10 years from now, where are we? Ron. Ba back here, it's okay. Uh, <laughs> so just to, to, to close on Fran's comment, uh, which demographics, the demographics for impact investing are incredibly favorable 
because the millennial generation is really, 10 years from now, the millennial generation will control significantly more capital than it controls today. And every indication is that a good deal of that capital will be invested for impact. That will propel the other industry players to begin to move in this direction. Um, this is more of a wish, but uh, 10 years from now, it'll be 2027. We're almost on the cusp of 2030, which is the sustainable development goals. And we've, we've, hit, we've, hit, we've hit the targets. Mm -hmm. um, in 10 years, I hope that we have moved closer to pricing positive and negative externalities into the public capital markets, so that now it's a source of alpha, but I hope that we move to a place where it's actually not a source of alpha anymore, and it's just that, that environmental and social risk and reward is priced into the, into the, the capital markets. Dave? I'll answer your question by answering his. What was the biggest smile in those last 10 years? I, I think two things. One is uh, the uh, incredible uh, enthusiasm and I, I think success of the Sustainable Investment Challenge, uh, which uh, was a challenge contest to leading B schools around the world uh, to, to, and B school students to invent investment vehicles and, and that, that had an intentional impact. And every year it's inspirational. Half the, well, the, this entire panel has been drug in by me in one form or another to judge or to sponsor uh, this thing over the last six or seven years. And that's been, a, that's been an incredible source to see the energy, enthusiasm of basically 28 year olds and, and what they are willing to do and invent to change the world. All right, and several of these products that they have invented have now seen the light of day and it's inspiring. All right, so now we have like, you know, 60, 70 business schools from around the world uh, engaged in this, in this activity. That's wonderful. I, I think another thing that brought a great smile was we had this harebrained idea, and one of the sponsors is in the room here, to convene uh, leading, uh, in, not leading, instructors, professors from around the world that were teaching classes in impact investing and sustainable finance. And we did that this summer at Kellogg, and we thought, oh, geez, you know, maybe we'll get 12 people to show up. We ended up finding well over 100 classes that were legitimate in uh, being taught around the world, and they're still coming in. And we were able to convene 50, uh, you know, professors from around the world to talk about how they're teaching and what they're teaching and how they're teaching students in this and the enthusiasm that students have in this. And I think the most interesting indicator there is that if we had convened or tried to convene something like this three years ago, I would say that if we were even able to get 50 three, four years ago, almost every one of them would have been an adjunct. Mm -hmm. And this, it shocked me. This summer, we had 50 some odd participants, and half of them were tenure track professors. Real professors, okay? <laughs> and, and, and that spoke volumes about how this is entering the dialogue at leading schools around the world. That, that makes me smile. And, and that also gives me hope for what the revolution from within will cause uh, in 10 years. And so let me close by saying in 10 years, I hope we're back here. I hope it's as big or bigger. I hope the community nature of what SOCAP has been, which is a place where friends find each other every year and it's on the calendar, continues. I hope deals get done. And I hope that impact and investing have continued to move closer together to be essentially the same thing, where smart investing is impact. And I hope that you'll all be back here with me on a panel how old we are <laughs> and how much the next generation is doing. So thank you, everybody. It's time for the evening reception.